Not so long ago, most Americans got most of their news from television. But to put a spin on Walter Cronkite's old line, that's the way it was. We're living through a digital revolution that is transforming our lives in so many ways, from how we bank and shop or even hail a cab. And how we consume news and information is changing, too. Welcome to After the Fact, a podcast that tells the stories about the numbers shaping our world. I'm Dan LaDuke from the Pew Charitable Trusts, and joining us today is Amy Mitchell from the Pew Research Center. As director of journalism research, she studies how Americans receive their news, an important thing to know more about since the free flow of news is in many ways the lifeblood of our democracy. Her recent report provides this episode's data point, 67%. That's how many adults in the United States now say they get at least some of their news from social media. So, Amy, this new report has shown the real impact that social media is playing and how people get news and information in the country. What are some of the highlights? Well, we saw some modest growth overall from 62 percent in early 2016 up to 67 percent of U.S. adults that get at least some of their news through social media. That growth, what gets more interesting is when we divide that by different demographic groups. And so first, if we look at age, the growth is occurring among the older population. We now are at a point where more than half of U.S. adults who are 50 and older are getting at least some of their news through social media. That is a first time development through these data. We've also also seen the increases this current year among the less educated and among non-whites, so that we now have majority of non-whites, more than 70 percent, that are getting some news through social media. And so to see that growth among the older population is really bringing sort of a new crop of folks into this space. Well, talk about that, because I found that interesting, too, in reading it. You know, it's sort of we, we have a tendency to still view the whole technology thing as for younger people. It's clearly now a more pervasive thing for people. Absolutely. And this finding is consistent with other areas of growth that we've seen digitally. So, for example, when we ask about mobile news consumption, getting news on your mobile device, we're at 85 percent of U.S. adults who do that. But again, the growth that we've seen this past year in 2017 was among the older populations, the older age age groups. The young people, part of that is because the majority of young people are already doing these things, so they're already there, right? So there's not as much room to grow. But it's also the case that the older population is beginning to to be more comfortable, to use these devices more often. We do ask people that get news on their mobile and on a desktop what they prefer. And even though we have now over 60 percent that prefer the phone over the desktop, That is the case more for young people than for the older population. So they have yet to prefer the phone over the desktop, but they are using it uh, in that way for news. It's a smaller screen, right? It is so different. I mean, I got in the elevator the other day, and there were four people all staring into their phones. And they were receiving news and information on an elevator ride. So a generation ago, you sat down with your morning newspaper next to your cereal, or you tuned into the newscast at the end of the day, and it was a planned event. Now, if you're on your phone and you're checking Facebook, it might be because you want to see what your friend's vacation picture looks like. But in the meantime, someone might be sharing some news story from somewhere, and you just happen upon it. That's right. It's the happenstance, and then it's also the fact that it's mixed in with a lot of other kinds of activities. So it's a different sort of process, a different kind of intake. By having this sort of happenstance of happening on news, what does that actually mean to how people are informed? Well, it certainly has a number of important questions that come underneath it. And one is, what are people ultimately learning? What kind of information and news do people get exposed to? It certainly is a part of the conversation around misinformation today, fake news, misinformation. How aware are people of what they're getting, of what they're receiving? How much do they care? How do they make choices about what to pass along? I'm fascinated by that point because it's, you know, like you said, in the old days... (laughs) Not so long ago. And when you had the newspaper, you knew what the source was, right? You you knew it was your local newspaper or somewhere else, but you knew it. And when it comes in social media, as you were saying, sometimes the where it's coming from isn't easily remembered or discerned. Well, certainly in the digital space, it puts more onus on the citizen, on the member of the public to parse through and figure out how to make sense of the information that they're getting. So for the purpose of this report, how did you actually define what news is when you asked this question? So for the last several years now, particularly when we ask about social media, we do qualify. We ask about news, and then we say, by news we mean information about events and issues that involve more than just your friends and family. So it is a broad definition of news. That can encompass a lot, but it does take people outside the purview of, you know, what I heard about my high school reunion or what my friends might be doing this weekend. 
but it doesn't necessarily get into the specific source that they may have used. It could be the newsletter from a political party, and they equate that with sort of a more mainstream news organization. Well, sure. This was not asking about specific right. sources. We right. do have certain survey questions where we're asking about the specific sources people may be turning to. And we know, for example, during the campaign, that three in 10 U.S. adults said that they got some of their election news and information directly from the campaigns, either through their social media posts, through emails, or through their websites directly. When we ask about the specific sites, so there are a range nine in this case that we ask about when it comes to news, and there where we saw growth was actually not at Facebook, even though it's still the biggest, but was among three others, Twitter, YouTube, and Snapchat, who all stood out for substantial growth in the portion of its user base that's getting news there. So for Twitter in particular, 15 percentage point increase in the portion of its users. So they're now 74% of its users, which amounts to 11% of the public overall that are getting some news there. You carry that through to YouTube and to Snapchat, and their increases were 11, 12% of their user base. But that puts YouTube now second to Facebook in its overall reach of U.S. adults for news among the social media sites. So as social media becomes a place people turn to news, the social media sites themselves are starting to take initiatives to sort of act on that and provide that and make that easier for their customers. We've seen steps that these technology companies have taken over the last several years, both by reaching out to the news organizations themselves to teach them tools that can be used to have their content look better or feel better or distribute more easily in their spaces, and then also reaching out to the public in terms of having things be a good experience for them when they're getting news or more easily shareable or findable. So for example, if we think about Twitter as one of the places that saw a lot of growth, it did of course coincide with an election year where there was a lot of activity on Twitter and also a a president that is using Twitter quite frequently um, to put out direct communications with the public, although we can't, you know, tie those things directly together. It was also the case that Twitter had its own initiatives that it took, for example, the live streaming that it developed and began in this past year. So we're now at three quarters of Twitter users, roughly, that are getting at least some news through that particular site, which outpaces the portion of Facebook users that are getting news there. YouTube has now a channel on its homepage for breaking news as well. And Snapchat has really worked on bolstering its discovery element, which is the news portion of its site, and has brought some quite large names recently in, including CNN, NBC, and The New York Times. It's going to be curious, the the American conversation in the coming years when people are going to say, yeah, I, I saw that on Snapchat, but it's actually going to maybe be a CBS story, right? So trying to figure out where stuff is coming from is going to get harder in, yeah. in the conversation, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's really interesting. And when we ask people sort of to name main sources for news, you know, Facebook can be named as a main source for news among some of these folks. So, But Facebook doesn't have any reporters at the White House. That's right. Exactly. So it is an interesting dynamic. And one of the other elements that's been fascinating to see is that in all these social media arenas, none of them were designed initially as a news platform, even to have news as a part of their platform. Whether it was Twitter or Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram, it was social and news was not a component. But as more people spent time there checking in over the course of the day, part of what they're doing and wanting to learn about is the news, right? Is what's happening. And so news has found its way to different degrees uh, into each of these different social media platforms. One of the other things you pointed out in the report is that people still prefer sort of watching their news to reading their news. That's always sort of been true, right? I mean, obviously, the TV networks always had bigger audiences than newspapers did. But how's it playing out now? Yeah, this was a really interesting finding. So this actually came from research from 2016 that we were doing. And we asked about whether people prefer to read, watch, or listen to their news. And there's a larger portion of U.S. adults who prefer to watch news than prefer to read it or to listen to it. We then paired that with a separate question about their platform preference. So do you prefer print? Do you prefer online? Do you prefer television, radio, et cetera? And what we found in that data is that the vast majority of people who prefer to read, 80% of those are prefer the web. So text reading has largely transitioned to the web. But for watching, the majority of that 
still was occurring through the television. So the majority of people who prefer to watch still are preferring the TV. But what's going to be interesting to see is that in this most recent data, when we ask about platforms, so in addition to the social media specific questions, we also asked about television in general, about print, about online, et cetera. And what we found was the gap closing very much between online and television, with the TV numbers coming down substantially and the online numbers going up. And so what's going to be interesting to see is if we start to see a similar sort of shift occurring among the watchers that we, we have not seen that yet and we don't have you know newer data on those numbers. But that's part the kind of thing that we will want to continue to watch. Does watching begin to shift across generations to the web the way that reading has? You know, journalism in America is radically different than it was a decade ago. Taking these numbers, what's the cool stuff to look for down the road? Well, there's always far more cool stuff to look for than we can possibly <laughs> right, take right. on in any given year. So our, our wish list is always very, very long. But, you know, certainly there are a lot of questions that still need answers about how people are parsing through information digitally. There are a lot of questions in those areas. There are questions about how what we're seeing on the political dynamic and its ties to news habits, how does that play out beyond the U.S.? And what's happening when we think about these sorts of things more globally? Thanks for joining us, and we hope you've been enjoying this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to listen to more episodes. And we like hearing from you. Contribute a review on Apple Podcasts or the streaming service where you tune in. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact.